Hey everybody, we are in the lounge here at the gym. It's what we call this thing at the 442 behind me, ready to rock and roll. And uh, here's something that's never been done before, but my wife actually wants to ask me a whole bunch of questions. We'll call it the Fast Furious Five, even though there's gonna be more than five questions. So fire away, Let's. what do you got? Most underrated bodybuilder of well, all time. Most underrated bodybuilder of all time. That's such an easy one. I actually did a segment on this on my VOB before. Charles Claremont. Not everybody knows that name, but if you look it up, Google is your best friend as always, folks. Go on Muscle Memory, and you will see Charles Claremont, an excellent, excellent physique. He was a little bit narrow, tall guy, about six, six foot one, competed in the, the toughest era of all time, um, which was that late 80s, early 90s. But um, this guy had a tremendous physique, and uh, I always thought he should have done it a lot better. I would also put Sonny Schmidt in there as well, but uh, definitely Charles Claremont for most underrated of all time. Most overrated. Oh boy. You know what, that's kind of an easy one, but I, it, it's it's not that easy of an answer, but here, I'll qualify it anyways, okay? Most overrated, Victor Richards. All right, and I say that for this reason, even though, I, and I say it's a tough one because I don't even really consider him a pro since the guy never stepped on stage as a pro. Even speculation even got his pro card, that whole thing was, set up in a bunch of bullshit, but um, the uncrowned Mr. Olympia and all this, and that, you can't be the uncrowned anything if you never even compete as a professional, so nah, that, that, like I say, pretty straightforward, Victor Richards, most overrated, never saw him dieted down, never saw him on a pro stage, we never even really saw him on an amateur stage, we saw him as a teenager, so sorry Vic. Best decade of bodybuilding. Oof, um, when you say best, Best decade of bodybuilding. I would, I would have for physiques. You gotta, I think, I think you gotta go with the '90s. The exposure. For exposure, for putting bodybuilding on the map and all that kind of, you gotta go with the '70s really, because that was Arnold and Lou and Pumping Iron. That decade really defined where bodybuilding was going over the next, you know, the future, right? Next few years, if not the decades. So physique-wise. I think you got, I think the 90s has it hands down. I've seen physique since I've been following the sport of modern era bodybuilding. Let's just go with that. Easily the 90s. Flex, Sean, Kevin, Ronnie, um, Rich Gasperi, Lee Haney, Samir Benut. Um, you can't beat these guys. Their physiques today are what everybody's crying for now, a return of those physiques. Right? Everybody wants to return, when they say the, the golden era, well, there's been two different golden eras. One was the old Gold's Gym golden era of the 70s. The other one is really referred to as the 90s. And um, hands down, if you put the 90s bodybuilders up against today's bodybuilders, I think those physiques were better. Dave, what was your best body part to you? Best body part? Um, geez, that's a tough one. I don't, you know, I, I honestly don't know if I had a best part. What I think. Was your, what was your worst part? Um, what was your hardest? Abs part? were never great. I never had really deep abs. Um, that would probably be amongst what I would consider as my worst, um, or not as strong. Couldn't have been too bad. Got a pro, pro card eventually. Um, but I think my strength was in was in my uh, overall appearance. Um, nothing really outshined the other. I think I had a very balanced physique. Uh, which I think was my hallmark, and uh, but I honestly don't think I ever nailed it 100% either, even in my wins. Best arms of all time? Who had God, that's a loaded question, man. Best arms of all time. I mean, Lee Priest certainly comes to mind. Um, Ruley Winkler. Uh, Phil Heath. Ronnie Coleman, you have to put up there. Uh, this is this is a tough one because you got some guys with some great arms, and then again, you got you always got the era problem, right? Like we always talk about, you can't compare eras. Back in the day, listen, uh, Arnold arguably had some of the best arms, although his triceps weren't, I wouldn't say great, uh, but his biceps certainly were. But you know, uh, Sergio, Sergio Oliva, his his arms were the size of his head, literally, which is why he was the myth. Uh, a guy named Freddie Ortiz. Back in the day, again, not a name a lot of people would remember, but if you're a historian of the sport, um, you know these names. And uh, Ruley Winkler of Modern Era and Phil Heath. Um, and 
and uh, Ronnie, those three, you, you could literally toss it up in the air, but you know, all over 22 inches, all complete with triceps and biceps and forearms. Um, Phil held his own against anybody in the world at his best. So. Best overall physique, just had everything going for him. See, again, another tough one. I, I wish, you know, I hate to be all over the place, but it's so difficult. Well, see, here, here's the just thing. One here's the thing, folks. I don't want to pull a, I don't want to pull a Biden on you. Yeah, folks, folks, uh, get vaccinated. Here's the problem, okay? You got different eras that you can't. Okay, of the 90s. Of the, okay, see, that's better, right? Because, listen, I'll go with Steve Reeves if we're going old school. Of, for overall, overall back in the day, but again, we're talking pre-1970, okay? Steve Reeves. No question, without a doubt, not even disputable. 70. If anybody disagrees, you're just wrong, okay? If you go, let's say, 70s to 80s, okay? Yep. Best overall, again, uh, you know, again, if we're completing the 80s, or if we're including the 80s, Lee Haney. But I said 70s, I didn't say 80s. Well, seven, okay, let's go by decades then, okay? So, 50s and 60s, Steve Reeves. Steve Reeves, okay? Hercules, Hercules, Hercules. All right, 70s, Arnold, okay? Obviously. 80s, Lee Haney, not even up for dispute, okay? Eight-time Mr. Olympia, one of the most complete physiques of all time, literally changed the game. 90s, this is where it gets funky, right? 90s, you got to go with Ronnie Coleman because, uh, but again, now he's late 90s, so this is where you start getting a little hairy, right? His early 90s physique was not the best because he wasn't winning Olympias until 98. So for that era, Flex Wheeler, even though he never won an Olympia, but how do you beat... Listen, how did you beat that physique? Even though he never won, and again, we all did, that's disputable, right? Maybe he should have won, maybe he shouldn't have. Dorian Yates, again, I got to give props to, but it's not my favorite physique. We're talking about complete overall physiques. Nobody beat Flex Wheeler at his prime. Overall, I don't care whether he won an Olympia or not. He won four Arnolds, and, and that was certainly enough to, to put him up there. Um, then you get into the 2000s, man. So, so now you got to go with Ronnie Coleman. Because Ronnie started in 98, obviously he went through the 2000s up until, what, 2000 and, what was it, uh, 6? 2005, I think, right? Yeah, so I think Jay won in 06, 07, lost in 08, so yeah. Um, and then you got uh, Phil Heath. So there you go. Uh, well, 2000 USA, clearly, as I uh, finally broke through the 12-year barrier and, and I got my pro card. Was uh, that your favorite physique? You know, I, yeah, I would say. Yeah, I would say. Um, a lot of people put the um, Night of the Champions up there where I took second to the, the German beast, Marcus Rule. Um, but... The USA was, was probably my overall best physique that I put together. Some argued, actually, my appearance at the Olympia was was up there. Um, I like that physique, even though it didn't do squat for placing. Um, probably various reasons behind that. But um, I, I liked what I brought to the table at that show. But, yeah, I, I would have to go with the i got to go with the USA. As an amateur, who was the one bodybuilder that you wanted to compete against the most? Mm. Good question. These are good questions. Um, initially, I would say Matt Mendenhall. And I got that chance, and I beat him a couple of times. Um, then, of course, he, he, unfortunately, he beat me at the 91 Nationals, which I still say is bullshit. Still calling bullshit on that one. Fifth place, put me in the sixth. Not cool. Still pissed about that. Uh, Matt Mendenhall was a tremendous, you know, God bless him. Unfortunately, a lot of these guys we've lost that we're talking about. But... Um, that guy, even Lee Haney said that Matt, this is from Lee Haney, okay? That, that says a lot in this world, in, in this bodybuilding world of ours. <clears throat> even Lee said, Matt Mendenhall had the best physique he's ever seen. And you beat him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I beat him. So does that qualify you as having a better physique? No. <laughs> no, because in all honesty, listen, did I have a better physique than Matt? No, probably not. And listen, I wasn't bad. I'm not, I'm not putting myself down. I'm not, I'm not you know, coming down on, my, on me. Um, but I don't have that kind of an ego, despite what some might say out there. No, Matt, Matt had a better physique if he would nail it. His problem was conditioning, which unfortunately was my problem. You get the best physique in the world if you're not in shape. 
Um, but, but he also had some bad luck. I mean, he competed against some of the greatest bodybuilders in history. Talk about a bad streak. He lost against Lee Haney, Mike Christian, Bob Paris, Gary Stridham. I mean, this guy, this poor guy showed up every year, and he had somebody in front of him that just happened to be better. And, but it was always because he didn't have but his structure, muscularity, proportions. They used to call him He-Man because he, like, he literally looked like a He-Man doll back in the day. He had the blonde hair, good-looking guy. Big shoulders, small waist, flaring thighs. Um, his symmetry and proportion were out of this world. And unfortunately for back then, that wasn't enough to get you a pro card. In today's day, he would have gotten a pro card 10 times over. But that was then and this is now. And uh, you can't compare then and now because it's a whole lot easier to get a pro card. As a pro with your best physique, who did you want to stand next to? Who did you want to beat? Well, I wanted to beat Rule at the uh, NOC, and I got close. As Beauty and the Beast was standing there, and you can obviously figure out who was who. Um, yeah, I wanted that one bad, man. I was right there. You know, it comes down to me and him, and I had a feeling it was going to go his way. He just had a lot of muscle, man. He had a lot more muscle than I did, and even though it's it's a lot of things combined, I mean, it's not just muscle, right? you got to have the small. I, I mean, my waist, my taper was better. My waist was trim. I was in shape. Uh, my symmetry and proportion were better, but he had probably 30 pounds of muscle on me, so that apparently was enough. And uh, But, yeah, I wanted to beat him bad. And... Uh, but there's a lot of people I wanted to beat bad, you know, back then. <laughs> Ronnie Coleman, not so much, you know. Nobody was beating Ronnie. <laughs> I don't care how bad you wanted to beat him. Your best physique in 2000, would you compete in classics now, or would mm. you can still go in open bodybuilding? You know, that, another excellent question, honey. You, you really need to, to get on this stuff. <laughs> um, you know, that's a great question because Classic is bodybuilding, okay? So it's not, people look at it as if it's something different. It's, it's bodybuilding, right? Even though we call it classic physique, it's, it's bodybuilding. Um, I would have been interested to see if I would have made the weight because I think it's really, really close. Um, so whether I could have made the, the weight cap for the height, at my height of height, if that makes any sense, I was six foot tall. Now I say that because with... Uh, back surgery back in 98 um, I lost an inch with back fusion as they had to fuse my spine together so it let's just say I'm 511 okay I don't even know what that cutoff is but I think it's just below what I could have achieved uh, when I won the USA I was 233 pounds all right which is on the lighter end but I was very aesthetically put together and you don't you know it doesn't really matter what you weigh on stage but um, and that's over the cap so I don't know if I would have if I could have lost any more and still had the same physique. So I probably would have had to have still been in bodybuilding because I think I had too much muscle. And then as a pro, I was up in the 240s to 250 range, which is clearly over the cap. Um, so, but listen, I guess it depends on what you grow up into, right? Because if it was an option back then, Sean Ray gets the same thing, right? If there was a 212 back then, would he have opted for that instead of the? Uh, you know, the Mr. Olympia, which obviously was competitive and should have won at least one of them. Um, but would that have been an option? And it's hard to say because it wasn't an option. Would you trade the 17 years that you spent on the Olympia stage as the MC 20. for one Olympia title? Ooh, man, these are good. <laughs> you know, probably. Really? Yeah. But you've been on yeah, yeah. And on the Olympia stage more than any other bodybuilder this, in history. This is true. Yes. This is actually... But you would give that up for one single Mr. Olympia. So this, this is my 20th year uh, with a microphone in my hand at the Olympia. Mm -hmm. I say that specifically because the first two years I was doing the press conference with Triple H, stuff like that, but I wasn't actually on the main stage. So actually it's my 18th year on the stage. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's, that's eclipsed anybody else of, of running time. Um, and listen, it's been great, and it's been memorable, and it's made me the voice of bodybuilding and all that stuff. Um, and it's been a great career, and it still beats a real job. But to say you were the best in the world, even one time, that's history. I mean, this is history, right? But it's not, listen, <laughs> I'm in the bodybuilding world. I, I got into this game to be the best in the world. My, my initial goal was to be Mr. Olympia. That's how most people that get into this sport want to be a pro aspire to right and I certainly did back in the day 
Um, and who knows what that could have led to, right? I mean, uh, had I had that opportunity. But that's a tough one to trade off, but I, I think I would take that trade. I think for that one moment in time on stage of being the best in the world, undisputably, that at one time there was nobody on this earth better than you, yeah, I think I'd take that. You don't consider that as the MC in bodybuilding? There's nobody better than you? I mean, listen, you know, as, as Carly Simon said, right, nobody does it better. Um, it's a great accolade. I, I take that with a grain of salt. Everybody's got their opinions. I'm sure, as people think I suck, <laughs> but somebody must like me because I keep they keep inviting me back. But let's just go on that limb and say that uh, that I am considered the, the greatest MC of all time in the, in the world of bodybuilding or at the Olympia, whatever. Right? I can say that. Listen, that's a that's a great accolade to have. I mean, that, that's a nice compliment. I mean, anybody. It doesn't match the bodybuilding but it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't match. Um, being being crowned Mr. Olympia, you know, and you know that's a prestigious title. Is is we've only had, you know, a handful literally, right, of of, of bodybuilders over the years that have been able to. Uh, what are we up to now? Fifteen, sixteen. What are we? Seventeen, I think now. Olympians. Somebody will correct me on that one. Um, you know, and that's pretty elite company uh, for a sport that's been around almost sixty years now. Next year, if I'm not mistaken, we're celebrating our sixtieth. Uh, Olympia anniversary, and there's only been less than 20 uh, people that have ever won it. So that's pretty elite company. In your bodybuilding career and your MC career, what is the greatest accolade you've gotten, according to you? And from who? Uh, greatest accolade I've been given. I mean, the, the fact that they're still in, inviting me is, is uh, very humbling. Um, I take that as a sign that they like what I do, what I bring to the sport. Um, the fact that people generally recognize me worldwide, and I travel the world, literally. Um, and they will recognize my voice. I've had people turn around at airports, at, at dinners, and they hear my voice and they, they recognize it from videos in the gyms, from obviously being on YouTube, for seeing the Olympian pay-per-view, they're a bodybuilding fan, whatever, right? And that's pretty cool. Like, it's pretty cool to be in a different country. And somebody will actually, you'll see somebody like turn and look at you, and then they'll come up to you and they'll, they'll ask if it's, you know, hey, are you, you know? And uh, that's pretty cool. But I've been given a few accolades. Uh, ben Weeder gave me a, a uh, achievement award many years ago and he was still alive. Um, that I, I uh, was very humbled to receive because it was from Ben Weeder. You know, it was from the Weeders. It was from one of the founding fathers of bodybuilding. Not a lot of people. I don't think anybody's been given that award since uh, the handful of us that received it that year. So that's that's pretty elite company right there. So that would probably be my top two. Professional memory to keep. What is that memory? I mean, I hate to keep coming back to it. But it would have to be winning the USA. I mean, you got to remember, for me... That turned into my Olympia. Like you say, you know, would you trade all in for one Olympia one? The USA became my Olympia. The, the goalpost moved at some point because it took me 13 years to achieve that. 13. Now, you're not talking about, you know, the Rocky thing where I was some also ran and got a shot at the top, you know, that type of thing, right? We get the analogies. They use a lot of those when I, when I finally won it. Um, but the difference is, is I came out smoking. I won the 87 Junior Nationals overall. And then came into the 87 Nationals as a top five guy. And then I took second place. I was right there. I was on covers. I was the next guy. I was the great white hope. I was all that stuff. And then it all kind of, you know, came to an abrupt uh, halt as, as, you know, I came up short. And then I started changing things and, you know, Blah, 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 you know, one year turned into two, you know, I'm in the top five, I'm, you know, he's the next guy, he's going to turn pro, you know, obviously keeping in mind it was a lot harder back then to turn pro, but still, I was a guy that was being, you know, applauded, that was being pushed, that was being uh, celebrated as a, not if, but when, and that turned into a 13-year chase, so nothing could, could ever replace 
I don't know if winning an Olympia would, would have replaced that, to be quite honest with you, because it took me 13 years to, to get that pro card that I wanted so badly. I wanted that title, and I wanted that pro card, and I was going to go until the wheels fell off until I got it because I knew that I had what it took to win that title and get that pro card. I had belief in myself, and I knew if I could just put it together, and I finally did, that I would get it. So when that moment happened, I could have never competed as a pro. I could have died the next day, and I was good because I did it. I finally did it, and that meant everything to me. <coughs> Um, Not the USA, though. Yeah, yeah. Past the USA, um, taking runner-up at the NOC qualified me for the Olympia, and then taking second at the Southwest uh, also qualified me. So qualifying for my first Olympia, and then stepping on the Olympia stage finally. So again, 13-year adventure. We already covered that, and then I actually got an opportunity to compete as an athlete in the Olympia. It was huge. It didn't matter where I placed. Obviously, I wanted to do the best I could. Um, something strange in the back of my head told me I probably wasn't going to beat Ronnie. Don't know what it was, but something. And um, that was a pretty cool moment because it's the Olympia. I mean, any, any, any Olympian that has stepped on that stage will tell you the same thing. Greatest moment of their career. Obviously, winning, of, of course, is, is, is great, too, but... But stepping on that stage for the first time, realizing that you are amongst the best of the best, and you made it to that Joe Eater Olympia stage, something you've been looking in the books, reading about in the magazines, when they had magazines, right, aspiring to in all these years. It's hard to replace that. When you look out there, and there's 10,000 people looking at you, and you're competing. I mean, you're up there with, listen, I stood there with Ronnie Coleman, usually next to him, because they go by alph alphabetically. So Coleman... Right, Chicarello and then Coleman were next to each other in that alphabetical line. I was always standing next to Ronnie. Not the best spot to be, but you know, listen, um, it was great to stand next to him and Chris Cormier and Flex Wheeler and Sean Ray. Who, you know, we, we went way back, you know, to obviously to the teenage days and all that. I finally made it, and that was pretty cool. And the other one I would say is getting my first opportunity to host the Olympia. I finally got the chance to get that microphone in my hand and show them what I could do. Because um, I knew I could do it better. I knew I could do it better than those people I was watching that were doing it, messing things up, didn't know what's going on, didn't have the, the inside knowledge to do it. And they finally gave me my opportunity. That was cool. Um, meeting Joe Weider in his office. I mean, how do you beat that? This is the, the godfather of bodybuilding. The father of modern bodybuilding, Joe Weider. And I got to sit down with him in his office, offered me a contract, which, which of course I signed. Um, and was able to actually be there with Joe Weider, uh, a part of bodybuilding history. So that you know, that really tells you like, oh yeah, I made it. I'm I'm sitting here with Joe Weider, um, and then you know, uh, being able to introduce all the Olympia, all the living Olympians. At that time, I think we had them all uh, still with us on stage. Um, that was monumental. Talk about a part of history. I stood on that stage with every guy who won the Olympia and Betty Weider herself. Um, which, again, you know, having uh, Joe and Ben Weeder tell me what a great job I was doing. Um, how do you, you can't replace those memories. I mean, th those, are, those are huge. Those are bigger than any awards. Those are bigger than any lifetime achievements you could ever get. Somebody gives you a, an award or a plaque or something. I mean, that, that's cool, right? I appreciate it. But you can't beat Joe Weeder patting you on the back, telling you, nice job. I can't do a Joe Weeder imitation. So, um, yeah. It was a different era. Yeah, no doubt about it. There was a passing of the torch. Nothing against AMI. AMI was corporate. Um, it was a business to them. They did, there was no love for bodybuilding. There was no, um, not to take away that we put on a good production because I was well uh, invested at that point into the production with Robin Chang and, and his whole crew and AMI. And um, he carried on the legacy very well. But yeah, there, there's a little part that can never be replaced when Ben died, and then when Joe uh, subsequently passed away, um, it was his, it's his show. It's still his show. It's still called the Joe Weider Mr. Olympia. It will always be called the Joe Weider Mr. Olympia because he came up with it. He for, he did more you know and furthered bodybuilding more than anybody else on this earth. 
and um, it's a bygone era, you know, and all things have to move, they have to change, but uh, yeah, nothing could replace, you know, and, I, and I'm just glad that I was around for that, because a lot of people, I mean, anybody around today, modern, was never privy to that. They never got the chance to see Joe, meet Ben, you know, that era of bodybuilding was, again, the greatest in terms of physiques. Um, the shows that we put on were utterly fantastic, whether it was at the Mandalay Bay, uh, you know, the Orleans Arena, or anywhere else for that matter. And um, you, you can't recapture that again. Still great, still the greatest bodybuilding show on earth. We, we do what we can to carry on the legacy, but you can never replace it. Yeah, I would say it has to. Um, this is all I've ever done. <clears throat> I've never had a real job <laughs> since 1987, since I was in the sheriff's department back in Rochester, New York. Uh, after that, it was off to the races, but I've made a living literally since 1988 um, in the bodybuilding world in some capacity, whether it's as a, uh, you know, uh, owning a gym as I did, training people, competing, um, endorsements with companies, you know, and I worked for some of the top companies, uh, working for Joe Weider when I obviously got my pro card, moved to California, um, any TV work, commercials, movies, things that came my way, opportunities, were all as a result of bodybuilding. This crazy sport that I got into when I was 12, 13 years old, and my parents wondering, what are you going to do with this, right? And my father asking after I won the USA, I'm proud of your son, congratulations. So how do you make money from this? And I'll always remember that because he wasn't wrong, right? I mean, it's like, well, how do you make money out of this crazy sport that you love so much? And uh, I did it, and I told him I'd do it. And um, it was cool, right? I mean, it's still cool to this day. I still have the best seat in the house. I'm still doing the Olympia. Um, my entire life has, has revolved around the sport of bodybuilding. I've been able to make a living from it from a sport that I love, and you know, like that old saying, which I can't remember, but you know, if, if you uh, do something you love, you never work a day in your life or, or something of that nature. So uh, it's been a hell of a ride. I, I hope it continues. What is your one piece of advice to the, the 20 year old who's in the gym, whose parents aren't necessarily on board with the bodybuilding situation? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a different sell today. Um, 20 years ago, I would have had a different answer. Um, well, you're a dad now. Yeah, yeah. To a 17, almost 17 year Yeah, that's true. And if she wanted to get into bodybuilding, I'd, I'd have to uh, heavily argue against it. <laughs> I hate to say that, but it's it's a different sport today. Um, the game has changed, right? The, 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 the goals have changed. It's a very tough sell to a young man or a woman today, especially a guy. Um, to try to convince them that with, you know, 10, 11, 12 years of hard, dedicated work, spending thousands of dollars, uh, putting all your time and your devotion into competitive bodybuilding. And there's a difference between competitive bodybuilding and just bodybuilding. I would encourage my daughter as well as anybody else to bodybuild, to lift weights, to keep yourself in shape, to build the physique that you want to, uh, uh, that you, want to uh, you know, uh, build and, and whatever your goal is to fulfill. But as a competitive bodybuilder, there's no money. And that's kind of a sad testament to where we are today, but th there's no money. The future does not look great. Um, you know, I hate to be the Debbie Downer on it, but I'm just being real. Um, magazines are gone. You know, there was a day where getting your face on a magazine was, was pretty cool. And I lived that. I actually went to the store and was looking at the magazines and saw myself on a magazine which was the coolest thing that you could ever do, right? I'm looking at me, and I'm like, holy crap, I'm on the cover of Muscular Development, right? I'm on the cover of the NPC News. Hey, I'm on the cover of Flex Magazine. You can't recapture it. Those days are gone, right? The magazines are gone, right? Video killed the radio star. Mag paper's gone. Magazines are gone, so that's gone. The whole weeder thing, that's gone. That's a, a, a bygone era. Um, supplement contracts, very hard to get these days, not like they were back 15, 20 years ago. Um, you could literally make a living with a supplement contract a, uh, in a uh, magazine, a publishing contract, which is what we called them back then. Those days are, are 
again, getting harder and harder. And prize money hasn't gone up significantly, really, at any of the major sh regular shows in over 20 years. So the problem is, is the uh, cost of living has gone up. It's almost double. There was $10,000 shows back in the day. There's $10,000 shows now. <clears throat> the problem is, is that money today is, is worth over $20,000. I've done the math on it, actually. So you're actually losing money chasing your dreams. And no pro sport should be set up like that. The whole thing should be overhauled, really, in my opinion, if, if it's going to continue. If not, I don't know what the next 10 years is looking like. Your comments in closing. My comments in closing. Um, Come on, where's your one-liners? I mean, listen. <laughs> I don't know if I've got a whole lot of one-liners. You know, it's just... It's, again, it's it's been a great ride. It's been a great, you know, to me, it's been a great sport. But um, I often wonder, again, what, what the future holds. And it concerns me because this is a sport I grew up with and I love. And I've, I've, been, I've been trying to be a, I've been a part, great part of it for many, many years. But I don't know if there's a solution. Um, and, it, and, it, and it bothers me a little bit because I don't know what the next 10 years looks like. I don't have a great outlook for where we're going as a sport, as an entity, as a federation, whatever you want to call it. Um, I see some troubled waters that I don't, I think if there's not attention put to it, so maybe this can be a Bob Stradamus uh, segment that you can use for, um, you know, Joe Weider put out an article back in his uh, Your Physique magazine, which I'm still looking for Your Physique number one if anybody's out there and you got one for sale. Um, very hard to get. He put out a prediction thing about what he predicted would happen in the sport of bodybuilding, which is actually a lot of it was fulfilled. But that was back like in the 40s, like literally. Okay? And the world has changed more over the last 10 years than it's probably changed over the previous 100. Okay? When it comes to our sport, we're not talking about technology and Wi-Fi and all that stuff. Even as a sport, it has changed so dramatically with the advent of um, social media, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, whatever, okay? Any of those type of things has literally changed the game and not for the better, okay? While it's given a platform for people to make themselves superstars on their own, everybody thinks they're a, a social media influencer now when they're not, okay? And um, an entity like ours, and I call it a sport, but it's, let's face it, it's not really a sport, right? I mean, sports are set up differently. You know, pro athletes make money in other sports. We don't. Um, it's, you know, it's closer to pageant than to this sport. I hate to say that because it sounds like it's condescending, but that's the reality of it. And um, I see some great changes having to take place over the next five years even. And if those changes don't take place, uh, I can see a future where uh, some of these shows and Hopefully not the Olympia, but uh, are in jeopardy. Um, a lot of the elder statesmen, as it would be, are old. Jim Mannion, you know, is, is 80. Arnold is 76. Uh, you know, again, a lot of the pioneers of our sport um, have done a great job getting it to this point. But the next generation needs to pick it up. And unless significant changes are made, uh, I can see this being a problem. So... You know, hopefully that's something that we can bring to the table. Hopefully it's something I can be a part of. Uh, well, I still got some youth in me, and uh, we'll see what the future holds.